Good evening, folks. As uh, Dr. Bell said, uh, we have two pandemics and they interlink because actually the pandemic of obesity, which we can't get rid of by an injection, um, causes people who get COVID-19 uh, to be at greater risk and greater risk of catching it and greater risk of getting complications and slow COVID, um, the long standing um, lethargy and other problems that can follow it, even if it ends well in terms of re recovery from the disease. Um, we're all very hopeful that the new Pfizer injection will solve all these problems. And if it doesn't, there are various follow-ons, including one from my own institution, the Imperial College, where we have a very similar approach to trying to prevent the disease. So one can't help feeling a great deal of confidence that one of these approaches is going to work. And therefore, one should be optimistic about the long-term outcome. And we just, as uh, they keep saying, wait for the next pandemic. But meanwhile, obesity is here today with us and staying with us. So I'm going now to move on to the next slide as soon as I can get that to work. So marine mammals have to be fat. If a marine mammal isn't fat, they die. They have very rich milk, and so the babies get fat very quickly. Fat is not a bad thing. It's just bad for humans, um, and for a particular reason, that we are a mobile species that has to chase after game and so on. And if we get fat uh, in the wild, we don't survive very long and therefore our metabolisms are not adjusted to it. But fat itself has a quite reasonable function and it's not necessarily bad. Also, obesity is not actually a disease. Um, in evolution, the average pair have 10 children in the wild when we were hunter-gatherers, and therefore the number of children mean that the population will keep on expanding and until they run out of food. This is the Malthus proposition. And the only humans that survived, therefore, were aggressively hungry. By aggressively hungry, I mean they killed other people to get food. Uh, since we've been the top species for a long time, we have, in fact, got a long history of murdering each other. And actually, when you look at today's politicians, you can see exactly where they're coming from. And of course, those that conserved energy, basically, well, you can rewrite that as lazy. So the new obesogenic environment provides lots of food, freely available, ready cooked, delicious because they've done tasting panels. And of course, it's also really easy to take no exercise. The elevators in every building. We used to have to walk to Brighton if you wanted to go from London area to Brighton area. Um, but nowadays we'd always take the train. So we don't take very much exercise. The consequence is that our population, which is designed to eat whenever they see food and not to take exercise unless it's really necessary, has become obese. Since we haven't evolved with obesity, the resulting metabolic e disequilibrium has caused a number of diseases. So why is obesity bad? Well, it's socially inconvenient. Um, it means that it's difficult to get about. And looking at facts, people who are overweight are paid slightly less and people who are obese paid about a third less than people who are normal weight. Um, divorce is higher, suicide is higher, etc. There's an increased incidence of stroke. There's an increased incidence of cancer. Now, that's actually a little unexpected but cancer rates are more than double in the obese. We don't understand why, but if you lose weight, your cancer incidence goes back to normal. So it does look as if it's real. 
if we look at other factors, I'm having a little bit of problem here. Diabetes is the big one to think about. Diabetes is definitely a consequence of too much adipose tissue. But other things like arthritis, like heart disease, like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which has turned out to be a much bigger deal than anyone thought. People used to say overweight people had fatty livers, and hardly unexpected, they have fat everywhere, fat around the heart, fat in the muscles, and so why not in the liver? But actually that turns into a nasty disease, a non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and that turns into cirrhosis, and that unfortunately can be fatal. So the biggest cause of cirrhosis in the UK now is not just pure alcoholism, it's also obesity. And the combination is really bad news. And actually Alzheimer's is about one third commoner in the obese. So generally speaking, being obese is not a good idea, but it's common enough. 69% of USA adults are overweight, and 34%, a third of North Americans are obese. Um, so that's really not at all good. Uh, in the UK, we reckon about 500 excess deaths occur every week from obesity. That's a pretty big number. I mean, that's more than a jumbo jet crashing every week. Uh, and it's not a good idea. If we look around the world, we can see that obesity is quite common in all the civilized places in the world. And it's actually getting to be extremely common in China and in India. Uh, in the wealthy cities in China, obesity is now getting to a North American levels. And actually the same is true of India. So you can see that when the countryside gets wealthier, it's going to be a problem there. Uh, I don't need to show these pictures of children overeating. It's interesting that this is happening in places here we can see in the Far East. Um, this is when we visited uh, China, sorry, Japan recently. And you can see that even the Japanese are getting overweight. So there's no question that this is a world pandemic is affecting us all and is the result of freely available food and lack of requirement for exercise. And of course, a societal effect is that we no longer are surprised by it. When you look at old films, you see everybody was very thin, or at least they're thin by today's standards. They're only normal weight, really. We've got used to everybody being overweight, which of course includes me. One of the reasons for this is... So this is advertising for what? Advertisers are not normally as honest as this. There are two features. Mr. What's it? is clearly grossly obese with enormous buttocks. And secondly, there's no respect for authority. The poor teacher trying to do something about it was squashed to death by the obese Wattit. This is not good. Sorry, I'm going to have to move on. There we are. So here's a map of North America showing overweight or weight calculations per state. And you can see over time, 1994, 2000, 2010, America has become obese. I mean, it's really a remarkable map. And then about 10 years later, they've become diabetic. So that's clear evidence of the progression. It takes about 10 years of being overweight before you become diabetic. It has another consequence, life expectation. So here we can see again, this time by districts rather than states, but 
between 61 and 83, there was a considerable improvement of life expectation as we started treatment of hypertension and all sorts of things, and of course, cleaner water and better road safety. Um, but here between 83 and 99, it's going backwards. People are now living less long, and that is due to obesity. Here's another map showing much the same thing, and we're getting reductions of 10 years of life expectation due to obesity. Now, how are we going to treat it? Well, it's all fairly obvious, lifestyle adjustments, and then perhaps some of the drugs that are available, which I come back to, and then finally our treatment for a metabolic disorder is surgery. What do you say? What is the lifestyle change that you're trying to induce? Well, more exercise, less food. Why doesn't it work? Well, most people don't want to take exercise and they rather like food. So it's just destined to failure, really. The NHS has woken up to low calorie diets as being a useful way of helping diabetics. And so they've started to advertise it and you can get it on, on the NHS. One of the questions I get asked in the clinic is should I take a low fat diet or a low carbohydrate diet or maybe even a high protein diet? What is it that's going to be really helpful? Unfortunately, we actually don't know. Um, this is really, uh, it really is unfortunate because it's fairly easy to study. There are, um, I suppose, about half a million papers published on diet. That's a really rather large number. When I was part of the foresight program that the government set up to look at future emergencies, one of which was looking at obesity, we had a large number of supporters who were able to go through that literature and work out exactly what the best diet was. Their conclusion was that almost all, uh, sort of euphemism for all, the papers written on diet were actually not worthwhile. They didn't study it properly. They were too short term. You need to look at it for 20 years and they looked at it for one year. And if we take something that was famous called the Atkins diet, which was a high protein diet, um, Mr. Atkins, who originated it and who actually died of obesity, never mind, um, pointed out that if you ate a lot of protein, beef steaks, lobsters, you know, delicious stuff, um, you lost weight. And this was true for six months. But if you followed it up by a year, the people on the diet had gone back to their original weight, even though they claimed that they were sticking to the diet. Now, when a patient or a person tells you they're sticking to the diet, it's all a perception issue. So a very thin person tells me that they've tried to put on weight because we deal with people whose um, menstruation has stopped due to low body weight. And we explain that if they ate a bit more, their periods would start up again. Uh, and they explain with a great deal of patience that they've now increased what they ate. I finished the entire chocolate biscuit, doctor. Um, whereas previously I used to stop halfway. So to a thin person eating a big single chocolate biscuit is an advance. The obese people tell me they've cut back on their diet and they hardly eat a lettuce leaf now. And I ask about biscuits and yes, they've managed to restrain themselves to two packets a day. Uh, it's just perception. They think that's restraint and the thin person eating one chocolate biscuit thinks they're doing well. When we put cameras in people's homes and leave them off for six months, so people do forget about them and then turn them on, obviously with their permission, et cetera, but we don't tell them when we're going to turn them on and watch what they actually eat. All the fat people eat a lot and all the thin people eat very little. So I don't think there's a lot of doubt about why it is we're getting fat. Exercise does play a role, but food intake is the main thing. So to go back to answering the question, low carbohydrate diets, well, we used to tell all our diabetics not to put sugar in their tea and so on. That's turned out not to be a good thing. When you actually do a controlled trial, people who put sugar in their tea did just as well. 
Um, there's some evidence a high protein diet is good, but it doesn't stay good. And it does do things funnily to your kidney and so on. Um, there was a massive North American study on low fat and high fat diets. And there was no difference in the outcome. So the idea you should give up eating fat, yeah, I guess you should. But when they actually studied it, it didn't seem to make any difference. Saturated fat probably is bad for you, but more about cholesterol deposition in your arteries than about global obesity. And olive oil, the Mediterranean diet um, thing is probably good for you. Mediterranean diets are ill-defined. Around the Mediterranean, they all eat hamburgers and other types of bad food nowadays. But if we go back to what you might call the Paleolithic diet, um, the original um, high vegetable olives, etc., cetera, um, at that point, probably it was a good idea. So I would say that the Mediterranean diet, as we think of it, high vegetables, high fruit, high nuts, and olive oil is probably good for you. That's about it. That's not a lot to go on. And when we say good for you, we don't mean it makes you thin. We just mean it's slightly less bad. So what about drugs? The second line, if lifestyle doesn't change and there isn't any diet that we can easily take that's gonna work a wonder, um, what about a magic pill? Well, all these drugs had their day. Uh, thyroxine incidentally does still work, but it kills you. So it's not a good idea. And we down to the fact that all of these drugs have failed. Rimonabant was very popular at one stage, but it's actually shown not to make you live longer. What it turns out is that you can make people eat less food by a number of means. I, I jokingly say adding cyanide to the diet does cause people to reduce does cause people to reduce their food intake, but they don't live any longer. So it's not actually a useful treatment. So the question is, can one find a medication that leaves you healthy, living longer and thinner? And that's the trick that we haven't yet succeeded in doing. There are some things available. You can block the digestion of fat with an enzyme inhibitor, Orlistat. You can give some fairly potent drugs which cause appetite to reduce, though you don't live any longer. Um, these two are in that category. The companies that made them sold so few that they went bust, so they've gone out, and that's also really true of that one. Liraglutide, which we use for treating diabetics, a GLP-1 mimetic, which is the body's mechanism for releasing insulin after food. If you give that agent, particularly the form Saxenda, which is the form made to reduce appetite, it does work. You get nausea and bowel disturbances and some people vomit. Um, so it's not without its side effects. It's also pretty expensive, but people do lose weight and we think they do live longer. There are some fairly long lasting trials now of about seven or eight years and death rate does not increase. So I don't think this is a harmful agent, unlike those three, which actually aren't licensed for administration in Europe. Okay, so this is the GLP-1 mimetic story. Um, semaglutide is now slowly displacing Victoza because it's once a week rather than once daily. Um, but you can see these agents in higher dose do cause weight loss, that's body weight, as well as helping with diabetes, that's HbA1c. Uh, as I say, there are significant side effects, so it's not an entirely um, free and home dry type medication, but those side effects aren't that bad and they're not at least dangerous. Feeling sick and occasionally vomiting isn't dangerous. So this does work. Here's uh, a rival company's product, Eli Lilly's Duo Gretin, which shows the same weight loss is also used for treating diabetics. So those two treatments from the Novo company and the Eli Lilly company are actually useful and should be prescribed. What really works? Well, what really works, as I mentioned earlier, is surgery. The most effective one is probably Ruin Y gastric bypass, um, where you take the upper small intestine and anastomose it halfway down the small intestine, which is attached to the esophagus. So this is bypassing this bit of the gut 
and taking food further down, why does that work? Well, there are mechanisms in the gut to say food is not being absorbed properly, stop eating. That mechanism is the release of hormones. Those hormones are found in greater quantities further down the gut. So the slower the digestion, the greater the release of satiety hormones. They go in the circulation to the brain and tell the brain to stop eating. And this is why you feel less hungry after a meal. You release these satiety hormones whenever you eat. And when you haven't eaten, there are no satiety hormones and therefore you feel very hungry. So it's quite a good mechanism. And when you bypass, what you're doing is stimulating this natural mechanism, pretending that there's been poor absorption of the meal and therefore don't eat it for a bit. And it works beautifully. You get this lovely weight loss. So just to reiterate, our appetites are set too high because we used to have occasional famines and certainly every winter there wasn't very much food. We therefore had to eat a lot when food was available to live through the winter and certainly survive the famines. So we're set to eat maybe one and a half times more than we really need. But by doing this operation and pretending the food isn't yet absorbed, by pushing it further down the intestine, the brain is fooled into thinking that it shouldn't eat as much. And this therefore counteracts the too high a food intake setting that we're all born with. And what are the consequences of that? Well, the consequences are you live longer. Um, myocardial infarct is halved and cancer rates are halved. Diabetes virtually goes away. So weight loss by this mechanism is really good. It has problems. It's expensive. About 0.2% of patients die in the procedure due to various complications. About 30% have those complications, but not fatally. Um, things like low sugar after meals and so on. Annoyingly, it can't be adjusted. You have a procedure to bypass a certain amount of gut. The more gut you bypass, the greater the weight loss, but you can hardly keep going in to readjust it. And the body does adapt. So it's, it's not the same one month, same one month to the next. By about two years, the effect is about halved for a given amount of bypass and weight increases, but never back to normal. So you do continue to lose weight or rather keep a lower weight for the rest of your life. It's just that the lower weight is much greater shortly after the operation than it is two years after the operation. Diabetes nearly always goes away if you're a mild diabetic. And as I said earlier, other good effects. But the most annoying thing in the NHS is the facilities to offer patients gastric bypass are very limited. The waiting list is very long. It's an expensive thing. You need special surgical facilities, etc. And for most patients, it's not practical. You have to have, well, I've got the nice recommendations here. You have to have two or more problems which would be solved by it before they recommend it. And you have to have gone through a lot of diet testing and tablet testing before you're allowed in. So it's really pretty difficult to get this procedure, even if you wanted it. So as I said, there are these hormones all listed here that are released in the gut when food comes down. And as food gets even into the large bowel, you get a big release of satiety hormones. And this is the natural break system to stop you overeating. Remember, if in the wild you got really fat, it was difficult to run away from the lion. And so that was an evolutionary disadvantage. Therefore, there is a limit to how fat you can get in the wild. These are hormones that we worked for a number of years to discover. So my background and the reason I'm a fellow of the Royal Society is that we actually identified them all. And this is some of the publications. We've been interested in working out if we can use these as a medical bypass, i.e. by giving these hormones, we could avoid the need for bariatric surgery, but even more important, we could adjust it to 
get everybody down to the right weight by giving them the right amount of hormones. We've done a lot of in-house studies. This shows us making up the vials and giving the injections and so on. And this was our first trial, which is now some long while ago. Um, this was published in 2005. And we had a placebo group who got injections, but nothing in them. And our active injections produced a really significant weight loss, as good as bypass surgery. We found that we were having two effects. We were not just producing food intake, we were also increasing activity. Now there's three types of activity, voluntary, non-voluntary, but movement and basal metabolic rate, the sort of activity when you're asleep, you just get rather hot. And we measured that, the basal one by oxygen uptake at rest, and the others by wearing an ActiHeart, which was the then equivalent of today's uh, iWatch, which is able to measure movement. So I've got a, a movement detector in my phone. It's really quite easy to do these days. And what we found was that when you had this injection of gut hormone, you had a decreased food intake. The gut hormone's name was oxintomodulin. So that's why this black bar shows let these individuals had less food intake, but you also increased your daily activity. And it was that that was causing most of the weight loss. We've given it to animals and we found we completely cure diabetes in a diabetic mouse model and greatly reduce food intake without any really important loss of appetite. And that was important because the problem with today's GLP-1 mimetics, Saxenda, et cetera, I mentioned earlier, is this nausea. This agent was not causing nausea because these animals were eating normal amounts. So we developed an uh, agent which we could inject in people once a week. And this is what's known as a phase one human trial with our agent being injected. And as you can see, even during the four week trial period, weight loss was considerable. So it looked as if it worked and there were no side effects. We're still working on that. So that's my own hopeful contribution to treating diabetes. That's the word for obesity and diabetes. Um, in conclusion, obesity causes a lot of ills. It is killing people. There's a mass epidemic. It's worldwide. Telling people to eat less and take more exercise has a very limited effect, unfortunately, and drugs currently available are not very effective. Surgery works, but you can't adjust it and it causes side effects and it's very expensive. Research is continuing. Research is motivated by this. In a capitalist society, if you can sell a drug, you can make money. Money then makes people invest in whatever company you set in. Uh, so we set up a company called Thiakis in which we were starting to do this. It was sold on and eventually it hasn't really gone very far. But look at the possibilities. Three billion obese people need treatment. That's to prevent 800 obesity deaths every day in the USA. And no medication at present. So it's an open market. You've got that large number of people requiring treatment and nothing that really works at the moment. A large number of those are wealthy. If you made a drug that worked, you could maybe treat 5% of them at least, maybe more. The net profit to the UK would be 1.5 trillion. We probably solved the entire COVID-19 financial problems of the UK if we got a successful product. So there's a lot to hope for. That's one thing to think about. Another thing to think about is this. Hunger is a really basic human emotion. If I'm, if I'm very hungry and I really want food, and I happen to have a gun, I just might shoot you and eat you. I mean, people that got stranded, a plane crash on the top of the Andes, they did eat each other. Um, ships that go whaling and expect to get a whale and eat the whale on the way back because they can't carry enough food. If they don't catch a whale, they eat each other. That was well documented in a number of 
episodes of um, whaling in the sailing ship days when it took a long time to go whaling. So this is a pretty standard human behavior. Cannibalism is not so unusual. And that's because one can think of nothing else but food. It's a really powerful emotion. If we can modify emotions by the means of a hormone, could this be the beginning of a new era whereby we can control everybody's emotions, perhaps make them work harder or be nicer or lose that tendency to fight, which human beings are born with, because that's the only human beings that are left alive, the ones that fought successfully and didn't die. Well, it's a possibility. It's the brave new world. I'm not sure I actually want it to come about, but maybe. Okay, I think it's time for questions.